So I'm going to talk to you tonight about uh, uh, the Jibix project and some of the stuff related to that. Um, I'm Dennis Sosnowski. I'm the primary author of the, the Jibix project. Um, about Jibix, well, Jibix is all about um, converting XML to and from Java object structures. Um, the project has been around for a long time. I actually started back in uh, 2003 in response to what I saw as horrible performance from the uh, frameworks that were in use at the time, primarily Caster and uh, there was something called JAXD 1.0. Um, both of those offered pretty, pretty bad performance and I was offended by that thinking that the process of converting stuff to and from XML should actually be a lot faster than working with it in the form of a DOM or, or document model of some sort. I had done some studies back around then uh, on the performance of working with XML and DOM um, models, and I published a couple articles on that in IBM Developer Works. And so Jibix was kind of an attempt initially to see how I could do things faster. And it was also kind of a, a thing to experiment around with some techniques I found interesting. Um, I've come across the idea of bytecode generation, bytecode modification back in the, the early 2000 time frame. And I thought that was just the neatest thing around, to be able to go into the class files and actually modify what, uh, what the code was going to do. So I based Jibix on that, uh, that bytecode enhancement technique that was also used by some of the, the database tools at that time. So Jibix works by binding definitions that are then compiled into this added bytecode. Uh, the added bytecode in turn calls Jibix runtime methods for actually converting to and from XML and that's basically how the whole thing operates. That's great. So the, uh, the schema and WSDL generation from code um, is obviously a convenient feature if you're working from existing code and going to expose that as a web service or if you want to work with it in the form of XML documents. Code generation from schema is going the other way around where you have the XML schema definition that represents the data that you want to work with and you want to generate a data model to represent the data code first. Well, um, this is the schema and WSDL generation from code that I mentioned first off. Um, depending on how much of you've read in the SOA area and some of the people who write about uh, the whole SOA idea, which lately has been losing kind of the cachet that had been associated with it for a long time as people realize that there's some drawbacks to the whole SOA approach, basically in terms of flexibility and rigid interfaces and all that sort of thing. So, code first though, is not inherently an RPC encoded approach. Code first works fine with, uh, with document literal as well. It's just that you have to have a proper tool for generating the schemas from your code. Um, when it's done correctly by using an appropriate tool, it does have the advantages of allowing you to develop schemas much more easily than you can if you're writing them by hand or working with any of the schema tools that are currently available. Uh, it also allows reuse of existing code assets. So, <clears throat> with Jibix, I've tried to make the generation of schemas from existing code as easy as possible and as flexible as possible to change that text. XBIS is something that I wrote back in uh, around 2002 or 2003, somewhere in there. Um, basically, it's an encoding for XML data that allows you to have a more compact representation than text XML while also being faster to process. So it's a way of encoding XML um, to avoid some of the overhead involved with uh, the normal text XML exchange. And the example application that I've been using for a long time for um, checking web services performance was the right key. Hello. There. Um, has been uh, an application that basically returns uh, uh, earthquakes matching a query. So I have a CAN database that has uh, Oh, I don't know, uh, 100,000 or a couple hundred thousand earthquakes uh, uh, that occurred all around the world over a uh, period of several years and with a range of magnitudes and all that sort of thing. What I'm going to show you today is using Access 2 with both ADB and Jibix data binding, using Jibix WS with uh, uh, SOAP over HTTP and both SOAP and POX over TCP with, uh, with XBIS, and RMI. Okay, the variations there. Um, well, HTTP, of course, is just a standard protocol that you use for accessing stuff on the web. So when you point your browser at something, you're using 
the HTTP protocol to go out and get the data back from the server. Most web services are done using HTTP as well. Um, however, it doesn't have to be. You can use alternative transports, and Microsoft in particular has been uh, pretty big on using TCP IP and even UDP as alternative transports. Um, they have some advantages over HTTP, especially the TCP one. TCP IP maintains a connection that just stays open for however long you're doing something. HTTP, on the other hand, uh, only reuses the connection for a limited number of times. Um, so for the performance test, I generate a sequence of queries that use a pseudo-random number generator, meaning that each time I run it, it performs the same sequence of queries. And it means that every time I run a test on two different variations, they of course use the same sequence of queries, and each query returns the same number of results, and everything's very standard. This is using Access2 again, but this time using Jivix. Now, first result came out significantly slower than, Access, than uh, ADB. Second one came out about on a par with it. In general, um, that's sort of typical. Jivix tends to work about the same speed as Access2 ADB when you're using it in Access2. Now, let's take a look at uh, uh, Jivix WS instead. Um, I have a few variations set up here. Let's start off just running it connecting to Tomcat again and uh, running directly over TCP IP or running over uh, HTTP. Well, as you can see, the results came back much faster uh, 1.3 seconds versus the, the 3.5 before, 1.4 this time. So, pretty consistent there. First, the local test times. Um, this is running a more comprehensive set of tests. The, the quick little example that I just showed you was just a demonstration. Uh, for the actual performance tests, I run more queries and get back more data, and I time them individually. I don't print out the stuff to the console, so there's no delays from that, all that sort of thing. This shows you the, uh, the timings that I had for running those four different types of queries with different numbers of results coming back. So, the different values I have shown in this graph are first off, Access2 using ADB, Access2 using Jivix data binding, uh, Jivix using um, just a standard SOAP over HTTP, and Jivix using SOAP over TCP IP with XBIS, and Jivix using um, just plain old XML over TCP IP with XBIS. Now, a lot of these little differences in timings aren't significant. It varies from one run to another, and for the results I showed here, I basically ran each test three times, and for each framework, I picked the best results of the, the three tests. So, these are kind of typical results, but they're not, uh, not that stable from one run to another. But you can see that the access to ADB time tends to creep up as the data volume gets larger. Remember, the ones over here are where you're getting back a very large number of um, responses. Basically, you're getting an average of 11,000 responses for every query. So there's a big block of XML data that's coming back. So Jivix clearly does a better job than ADB when it comes to you know, actually converting the XML to and from um, uh, data, data objects. In the case of uh, the smaller volumes, though, you don't see that. So what that's saying to me is that, in these cases, it's the overhead of actually going through Access 2 that's kind of the predominant influence. So that's sort of the basic per request overhead that's showing up there, I think. Um, Jivix going over TCP IP. Well, in this case, we're going to the same exact web server, to the same Tomcat instance. It's just a different web app within that Tomcat server. So you can see that Jivix WS, right off the bat, offers much better performance than Access2 um, for, for accessing this stuff locally, at least. Um, when you go to um, using XBIS encoding over a TCP IP connection, the times get even a little bit better. Not dramatically so, though. It's only uh, showing up a little bit. So here's the same set of tests, but run remotely to a server in uh, the U.S. over a fairly yeah, not a, not a very high bandwidth connection, apparently. Uh, it's interesting that now, 
Whereas before, it showed like an increasing curve here with the axis to um, ADB times. Now it's more of a, a dip. Anybody have a suggestion for why that might be? If you remember the, the nature of the different tests going on here, this one involves 200 requests, and this one only 10, this one 20, this one 100. I think it's pretty much related to the number of requests going through. License on the line. Yeah.